data in the music business. It's a completely boring subject, but it is the subject that you're going to make money with. So I thought you might be interested in learning a little bit about it. So I've got here a little diagram that shows you what happens with music after you recorded it and you want to release it. So in the music business, there's basically three parties that really matter, which are the writer, the composer, and the performing artist. So the moment they record a word or a song, however you want to call it, you get a split. The writers and the composers are being represented by the publishers and the performing artists are being represented by the record labels. So this diagram is a little bit vague, so uh, what I will do is I will put it online on our website. So when you finish this, you can download it uh, after the presentation, like tomorrow or something. So, when a song is recorded, it flows through the record label into online retailers or into physical product like CDs, DVDs and those are distributed by physical retailers. It flows to radio stations, television people, etc, etc, etc. So your product is going out in the marketplace and then something interesting happens because normally when you sell like a, a bottle of Coca-Cola, you put it in the shop, somebody pays for it and you're going to get your money. In the music business it works a little bit different because there's also, um, let's say for example, when a radio plays a song, then a collecting society will collect from the radio station and then once they've got their money, once or twice a year, they pay that money to the publisher. Or when it's a public performance royalty for the performing artist, in Holland uh, the organization is called the Sena, uh, it's about neighboring rights. So whenever a song is played, for example in this venue, uh, they have to pay for that and then eventually the money will end up with the artist. Now, this sounds very easy, but this is not the case. Because in the old, in the old world, Everything was organized country by country. So you have to imagine you record something, you find a label, and then that label finds a sub-label, you find a publisher, and then the publisher finds a sub-publisher. And in each territory you have parties that help you to organize your business around a uh, song or a collection of songs, like an album. Now, what was important, let's say, before 1999, because the internet already is a little bit longer there, but before music really uh, starting to hit the internet, we were around 1999. Before that, it was important that you had great duplication factories where you can produce CDs. You have to have fantastic distribution, you know, you have to select your products and uh, pack them in a box and then ship them to the retail uh, outlet. You made your money uh, through radio, through television, and then you had to collect your money territory by territory. And it was uh, yeah, a pretty, what I call, a linear supply chain. So a product moves from A to B to C, and money moves back from C to B to A. So if you look at a music business, there's two sides of it. On one side you've got creation, and on the other side you've got consumption. And if you look at the cost of running a music business, before 1999, your cost would go primarily into production and distribution. Here you need your factories, you need your trucks, uh, you need basically everything that you, you do to create a product. Of course the creation side and the right side uh, were uh, important but you know that cost um, compared to what happened after 99 stay, stay pretty much the same. On the experience side, so basically the free record shop that's putting a CD in a shelf and sells it to you, it's pretty easy. And then something funny happened, because then the internet started to hit and suddenly the moment you recorded the song and you would release it, it was available globally. And all the infrastructure that the industry created, local collecting societies, publishers, record labels, suddenly completely lost control over their business and started to lose money. Because I've got a question for you guys, because you're young. How many of you still buy music? This is pretty uh, interesting, but I think that's the case because I also sometimes uh, work with people in, uh, in high school, like 16-year-old kids, nobody pays for music anymore. That generation is completely lost for the old model. What they do, they go online, they, they, they go to their social media, they go to their illegal download uh, stuff. 
So after 99, I believe, and this is how I build my company, I believe you need a new infrastructure. And that infrastructure consists of hardware, or you do it in the cloud, you know, that doesn't really matter. You need storage and processing <laughs> capacity, software to manage all of those transactions and to manage that audience online and to manage the flow of your data, which basically stands for your music, because in, in this case we're talking about music, so when you put it on the internet it becomes data. Your data, instead of flowing to free record shop, uh, Virgin, etc., etc., it goes to iTunes, Spotify, uh, all those you know, online stores where you can download music or where you can stream music. Uh, broadcast is, you know, yes, still we have radio, still we have TV, but now blogs are very important, social networks are super important. And then you come to the revenue collection, and here's where it becomes interesting. So take, for example, the, the point of view from, um, let's say, Spotify. So Spotify, uh, do you all know who Spotify is? Yeah? So Spotify had to clear a, li a license for their catalog, country by country, in order for them to roll out their music service. It's very expensive, it's very difficult, the rules are different in every country, so for them it was a big pain in the ass. And then suddenly the artists that want to collect on their revenues also still need to use that old collection uh, infrastructure to get hold of all of their money. So what has really changed, and this is uh, I think a very important thing, is that after 99, Everything is global and should be organized accordingly. But what does it do? Because it's far less expensive uh, to send a piece of music to iTunes than to have a truck drive from a warehouse into a retail outlet. It's far more uh, uh, less expensive than to just duplicate a song on a computer than to have a factory that's actually pressing uh, products and then uh, you put it in a truck and you move it to the retail outlet. So on the creation side, you know, it didn't really change. Yes, of course, it's easier to record music, but then again, in order for you to create products, you've got so many different platforms, so you need so many different uh, appearances of your product. The right side became way more complicated, because how are you going to now, instead of having, let's say, several parties that you work with, suddenly there's on the internet thousands of places where your music uh, is going to be. So it becomes very complex. The production and distribution side, uh, we as a company, we deliver around a million songs on a monthly basis to different, what we call digital service providers, so places like iTunes and Spotify. And the cost of doing that, it's not even 1% of a, what it used to cost in the physical world. Then on the monetization side, it becomes way more complex because now you have streaming, you have downloads, you have internet blogs that, that put your music on there. There are so many different ways of how you're going to make money with your music. And then on the experience side, ask Spotify how much they needed to create that experience in terms of capital. I think Spotify, the investment to get it to the level where they are right now, we're talking about three, four hundred million dollars. So that's a completely different ball game than opening up a record shop on the corner of the street. So, why do I tell this? Because I don't, you know, I just heard some of you want to be in uh, music management, some of you want to be in events probably, but when you work with artists and you are responsible for the business of an artist, it's very, very important that the moment the artists start to create, because don't get me wrong, data is important, but there's one thing that's way more important, that's the artist and the music that they make. But when they have recorded something, or when they have created something, that is the moment where you need to start record the data. Because if you screw it up at the source, it's going to be impossible to, once the music is out there on the internet and reports on usage are coming back and you start to collect your revenue, uh, to do that in a, in a very efficient and correct way, because it basically becomes a mess. So what is also very important, that the data is correct. So imagine your iTunes and you have 30 million songs in your library and all those 30 million songs are being delivered to you, but the metadata is not correct. So they have to eyeball each release because you don't want to have Metallica spelled with an M because then nobody's going to find it. So if the data is not correct, if there's spelling errors in it, and names of artists are uh, spelled wrong, etc., etc., you're not going to make any money because your product will go out there, nobody can find it, 
And then when money starts uh, coming back together with the reports, it's impossible to, to administer that. So what's also very important is that your assets are complete. Take for example an album on iTunes. Your album used to be like the disc, a booklet, a plastic cover, and that was your product. Now it might be an e-booklet, you want to package it with a video, you want to create real good products which are basically bundles of different assets. So if you deliver something to iTunes or a radio station and it's not complete, then your product will have an incomplete appearance on the internet. Managing this complexity, this is where you know technology can help you. So I'm, I'm very. Uh, the reason that I'm here right now is because for me, I've been on a journey of six years now. I've trying to change this industry, and I can honestly tell you guys, it's not easy to change the behavior of people that have been doing something for a long time. But you guys are the new generation. So in order for you guys to create a thriving business again, what you need to do is you need to put the right systems in place to deal with all these complexities. Now your artist uh, is going to be promoted online, social media. Twitter, Facebook, you name it. You need to be able to deal with those uh, uh, complexities on the internet. Your product can appear in a hundred thousand different shapes. You need to be able to understand, okay, what product went where, who owns the rights, and how do I distribute the money once I've received it. This is all um, basically super important. The other thing that technology can help you with, so imagine you bring something out on the internet, for example, on Facebook. Uh, the, the record has not been released yet officially, but you already want to do it on Facebook. Facebook provides you with data of who's listening to it where. So the moment you see where your customers are, then you can really start focusing your attention to where do you want to sell the product and you can set your priorities. Because what really hasn't changed uh, right now is the effort you need to make to put your product on top of mind. I think that has become a little bit more difficult than it was back in the days because today I think a, a, a conservative guesstimate, 10 times more music is being released than 20 years ago because it's easier to record, it's easier to distribute and now artists can do it themselves. 15 years ago there were big barriers. For you as an artist to get into the free record shop, you needed to work with established companies uh, in order to do that. Now if you want to be in iTunes, you go to TuneCore and even if you recorded it in your bathroom, you can put it online. 